While recently playing through Metroid for NES, I couldn't help but notice the abundance of plant life in the Brinstar region. From what I understand, this entire area is underground below the surface of the planet Zebes, which would mean that these plants have no access to sunlight. This was puzzling to me and got me thinking about whether or not plants could survive in an environment completely devoid of natural light. We're obviously talking about a video game's world on an alien planet, but let's start with what we know about plants on Earth. They innately perform photosynthesis, a process that harnesses the sun's energy to drive metabolic reactions in their cells. These reactions take carbon dioxide from the air and assemble it into glucose, a type of sugar that can be converted into usable energy by virtually all organisms on Earth. Photosynthesis is not exclusive to plants, but is completely absent in complex animals, and as a result, plants are normally at the bottom of food chains. They serve as a food source that is nutritious and usable by higher organisms. Without plants, the world would come to an end pretty quickly. Many kinds of lower organisms, like algae and bacteria, can perform the photosynthetic reactions as well, and all photosynthetic organisms are similar in one way. They all contain pigment molecules that allow them to absorb and transform the sun's energy. Chlorophyll is one of the best characterized of this molecule type, giving plants and other photosynthetic organisms their characteristic green color. Many of the plants in the Brinstar region are green, which suggests that they may contain chlorophyll, but its purpose in the absence of sunlight is questionable. A plausible theory is that Brinstar might have been previously exposed to the planet's surface and consequently a sun for a number of years. If this is the case, the presence of these pigments might be something that was conserved even after Brinstar went beneath the surface of the planet. The loss of genes coding for something as crucial as photosynthetic pigments through evolution is possible, but unlikely. So how are the plants in the Brinstar region surviving without sunlight exactly? There's a couple of possibilities outside of earth plant photosynthesis, and the first is that these plants might be predaceous. Organisms that don't synthesize their own food on a chemical level are called heterotrophs, and carnivorous plants fall into this category by deriving energy through eating other living things. One of the most familiar examples of these kinds of plants are Venus flytraps that lure their prey and dissolve them with acids to make use of their nutrient-filled insides. Though the plants in Brinstar don't exhibit specific features that might suggest that they're carnivorous, like movement for example, it's possible that Samus might not trigger a reaction in them if she's not the plant's desired meal type. In order for a plant to move any part of itself, a very high amount of energy is required, and plants won't just commit to something so strenuous unless the payoff is going to be worth it for them. A second possibility is that Brinstar plants are relying on some type of symbiont to survive. A symbiotic relationship describes two organisms mutually benefiting from the presence of one another. A good example of this in humans is how we depend on our gut bacteria to break down certain parts of our food for us to supply us with nutrients that we wouldn't normally be able to access. In turn, we provide bacteria with a safe environment to live with lots of food. Symbiotic relationships between plants and bacteria or fungi are abundant on Earth. Plants require nitrogen and other molecule types to live, and bacteria or fungi living near root systems in the soil can catalyze reactions to produce these things for plants. As a result, the plant can take up these chemicals to use while providing bacteria and fungi with a few benefits, like stability from soil erosion and protection from the environment. In the absence of light for photosynthesis, nutrient availability might be solely dependent on the activities of other organisms. A third idea is that plants might have abandoned photoautotrophy and switched to chemoautotrophy. Photoautotrophs use light energy to make their own food, while chemoautotrophic organisms don't require it. Chemoautotrophs instead use inorganic materials from non-living sources, like sulfur-containing compounds, iron, and hydrogen gases to produce their own glucose. Brinstar is particularly rocky, and leaching of minerals and compounds from rock into water is a known phenomenon that does occur on Earth. The waters of Brinstar may be similar and have high levels of chemicals and compounds that have come out of the rock, making it a great reservoir for chemoautotrophs. Chemoautotrophic behavior is usually only observed in bacteria that are living in some of the most extreme environments on Earth where there's very little organic material to use. Though no chemoautotrophic plants have been discovered on Earth, it certainly doesn't mean that they couldn't exist on an alien planet. Now, with all the evidence before us, if I had to take a guess at which one of these options is most likely, it would definitely be the switch from photoautotrophy to chemoautotrophy. 
There are some problems with the other two scenarios that would make them less desirable. First of all, the addition of a predaceous element for plants living underground would be beneficial for feeding as well as defense from herbivores and omnivores, but food availability for the plants themselves might be unpredictable. Even the carnivorous plants of Earth have a dependency on photosynthesis as a backup for food production during times when their prey might be scarce. There are also issues with the proposed symbiotic relationship theory. Even the best symbioses of plants with bacteria or fungi can go from mutually beneficial to parasitic in a flash when one of the participants is not having their needs met or becomes vulnerable for any reason. As soon as plants stop giving the bacteria and fungi what they need, they might become their next meal. Chemoautotrophy is the most reliable of the three and is likely being used by the plants of Brinstar in the absence of sunlight. A deciding factor in this conclusion is the basic need for plants to be self-sufficient. As the glue that holds most ecosystems together, plants need to be able to rely on themselves first and foremost without the complications of outside organisms getting in the way of their survival. If the plants of Brinstar evolved from plants in light-exposed areas, adaptations to move to a chemoautotrophic lifestyle might be possible through several avenues, like spontaneous beneficial genetic mutations, or even through something like the accidental introduction of bacterial extremophile DNA into plant chromosomes. Then again, it's also possible that Brinstar has existed for a long while and plants found on Zebes were always like this. If that's the case, no adaptation necessary. Whether they evolved or always innately had these abilities, chemoautotrophy is a possible explanation of how plants are thriving in the harsh conditions of the Brinstar region. Mm -hmm.